We didn't imagine that you'd go there for, uh, the way people talk about it today, going there for a couple of weeks and then coming back. We, th we thought of it as certainly several years to have a chance really to explore the planet, maybe grow the first crops and then maybe come home or maybe stay there. When Freeman got involved, he very quickly did this study on trips to the satellites of the outer planets where he showed that a little more fuel than going to Mars, you could actually take a longer trip, go all the way to Saturn, stop at one of the moons, refuel with more propellant. That's not nuclear fuel, it's just ice or something to pack around the bomb to, to get momentum to come home and, and come back to Earth four years later. Then the second trip would be to the satellites, which were already then well known to be interesting places. Jupiter has about six and Saturn has about four big satellites. Each of them could be a habitable world. We know that they have lots of ice and other chemicals that are essential to life. The particular place I was interested in was Enceladus, which is one of the satellites of Saturn. And that was interesting because it has a rather low escape velocity, so it would be easy to land. I mean, the human effort that went into these um, planning studies of trajectories to when was a good time to go to Venus and how you could go to Venus and Mars for just a little more fuel than Mars alone, but then you couldn't stay as long on Mars and you would get bored at Venus, there were no moons. And so all these questions became very real. There's a certain feeling about space and what's in it that is uh, just a big high. Everything that you can think of that people do is different in space from sexual activity to just plain feeling as though you're resting on a cloud. The idea that, that you personally, not getting things ready for somebody else, but going there and doing it yourself is unbearably exciting. I always thought Ted was very dreamy. He was thinking of this uh, Queen Mary-like thing which would float around the solar system. I always looked on it a little a little cynically. I mean, it was fine. I didn't have anything against it, but I wasn't persuaded that this was going to happen. We used to talk about going to uh, these far out to the edge of the, the edge of our, our solar system, you know, with the Ryan. And I used to think that, that was kind of preposterous, I used to think. There was few guys they were not interested in flying, no matter what it is. If you give them flying carpet, they wouldn't sit on it anyway. Me? Oh, I wanted to go. But my feelings were sort of hurt. That I mean, t Ted was talking about taking his children, and my father said we were going to stay behind. So he was going to go without us. I had just uh, been switching between one wife and another, and... and it wasn't clear what, whether I had any family at all for a while. While the Orioneers dreamed of colonizing Mars and Saturn, in the real world they were being sidelined. The newly formed NASA space agency opted for beating the Russians to the moon using Werner von Braun's chemical-powered rockets, not Orion. It was the first nail in the coffin of the project. NASA, quite rightly, refused to have anything to do with it as long as it was secret. And that's, uh, I mean, it was NASA policy not to have secrets, and I think that was right. As a civilian space agency, they do far better staying out in the open. So that was uh, another of the fatal handicaps we had, that we were kept very tightly secret. So instead it went to the Air Force, much to our annoyance. But still, we had to live with the Air Force then from that point on. And the Air Force was quite understanding. They knew this wasn't a military weapon. They were prepared to pay for it because there were lots of people in the Air Force who shared our feelings that it was a great chance to go into space. 
In the mountains of southern Colorado, George Dyson found two Air Force scientists and Orion supporters called Ed Giller and Don Priquette. Now neighbors in retirement, they were once colleagues at the Air Force Special Weapons Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Giller and Priquette were the key liaison officers for Project Orion. I don't know where Orion got the name, but I'll have to put my two bits in here at the moment. Because it is an impulse, an impulse system, we, we call it putt-putt at Kirkland, which the powers to be thought we were being a little flippant with. This theoretically was a factor of at least a thousand better than anything we had coming down the pike on chemical uh, missiles, rockets. Giller and Priquette liked Orion, but there were skeptics in the Air Force top brass who needed to be persuaded to keep funding the research. The liaison officer with the Air Force said, you got to show them that it'll work. You know, why don't you make a model that flies? The Orioneers built a free-flying model, and they made a film for Ted Taylor to take to Washington to show to the disbelievers. After the film, he said there was most marvelous silence. You could hear the pin drop because they were all proven wrong. And there it was, and nobody can argue with it. It worked like a charm. First time we tried it, we think took off like bat out of hell and flew. There's a film that shows this thing going bang, 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 and up it goes a ways. At least that part of it worked. <laughs> One of the things was always to worry about the stability of the system, which that test proved. It managed to give people a little bit of an idea just what this thing would look like. It gave you a real good idea what are these guys trying to do. Paradoxically, this success contained the seeds of Orion's downfall. It inflamed the military imagination in ways that would destroy the project. We were briefing some folks in the Pentagon once, uh, senior military people, colonels from all the services, about how big this payload would be. And in fact, you could put people on it. You could put 150, 200 troops on it. And this is when a Marine colonel popped up and said, that's just what I need to get my division across the Pacific in half an hour into some trouble spot. A trap was looming for the Orion ears. To get the money, it seemed they would have to pretend to turn the plowshare back into a sword and so betray the original peaceful aspirations of Orion. Officially, it had to be justified to the budgeteers as a military program, so they had to invent f fake military requirements for it. I had to name like sort of the six reports I would most like to get declassified. There was a report. 